wonderful to see this, this group turn out to have a conversation with Mildred Warner. Mildred is a professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning here at Cornell. She's also a research affiliated scholar with the Institute for Women's Policy Research and a research associate with the Economic Policy Institute in Washington. And I think you did your sabbatical there in 2005. Um, before doing this work, Mildred served as a program officer with the Ford Foundation in New York City, and she also served as the associate director of CARDI, Cornell's Community and Rural Development Institute. Um, she holds a PhD in development sociology and a master's in agricultural economics here at Cornell, and also she has a BA in history from Oberlin. Mildred's research explores the impacts of privatization and devolution on local government, the role of human services as part of the social infrastructure for economic development, and I think we first knew each other years ago through the Human Services Coalition here in, in Thompson County. Um, the, and she also works on local government service delivery, economic development, including the links between economic development and child care. Um, she works on planning across generations. That's the topic she'll address today. Um, but she's got lots of different supports for her work. Her work is supported by grants from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and several foundations, Peppercorn and Kellogg, for instance. She's written over 100 publications. Um, some, you know, some have been singled out for awards. Um, and she has a really strong orientation towards extension, and I would say a strong orientation towards translational research. She consults really widely with local governments and union leaders on local government reform, and, it, and also with childcare policy makers and business leaders on economic development strategies to support social infrastructure. And her recent work has taken her all over the world. So welcome, Mildred. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. chairs at the front of the room, three chairs at the front of the room, so I encourage you all getting your food late to stay around toward the front and come around and grab a chair. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I actually had the privilege of meeting Yuri Brodson-Brenner years ago, and I wondered why this college was named the College of Human Ecology. It sounded strange. And then I learned what his ecology framework was, and I was like, yes, absolutely, that's the way I... I think about the world. So yesterday we were at a talk where there was a lot of focus on the individual and the economy, but not a whole lot of focus on this nested framework of families and neighborhoods and communities. And so I want to be able to talk to you about thinking about those things uh, in, in that nested ecological framework, thinking about them across generations, and thinking about them as they relate to planning and to economic development. Because as a planner, these are the two worlds I work in. I work in the world of planners and I work in the world of economic developers. And traditionally, these have not been groups that have thought a whole lot about social services. And yet, with the devolution of the social welfare state, many of our social services are primarily provided at the local level, and planners and economic developers have a role to play, even though they might not have been trained in how to do that role. There are still two chairs left in the room, and I don't get to sit. So I welcome you all to come up to the front if you can find your way up here and have a seat and be more comfortable. I want to give credit to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which has funded this research, and so I've been able to give a little bit of a bias in the work toward rural communities and small communities, which I think face these problems with, with special constraints. Now, when you do translational research, what you happen pretty quickly to find is that you're pushing up against old paradigms. So on my work on linking economic development and child care, which started about 1999 with the Chamber of Commerce and the Child and Development Council here, and uh, we started saying, you know, there's something... We were facing labor shortage, can you imagine, at that time? And uh, hard to imagine when you're in a recession, but it was true. And there was some sense that the lack of an adequate infrastructure of child care had something to do with labor shortage problems. And so the Chamber of Commerce was actually quite interested in this, and we joined together with Sue Bell Hall of the Child Development Council and um, Mary Pat Dolan was head of Department of Social Services at that time. 
Um, Harold Hartnett, who since passed, was uh, Vice President of M&T Bank and was taking a leadership role. And we began to study the, the structure of this sector, think about it in terms of economic policy, and we actually were able to double public subsidies coming into the community from the state government, and we pushed on Cornell to create the new child care benefit, which is now uh, $1.8 million a year for families. So by, by making this economic development argument, we were able to um, essentially quadruple the amount of subsidy dollars for child care in the community. Still not enough to begin to meet the need, but raising a whole new set of, of actors and partners in this process. But, you know, child care is only one piece of it. Families feel a whole lot of stresses. And I was like, well, what else can we do to help busy, stressed out parents than just work on the child care problem? And that made me think about, could we create a more family-friendly planning? And I started looking around at all the ways in which planners create cities that aren't that welcome for children. And in fact, let's zone out low-income households because we don't want their children going to school and raising our taxes. And so I said, we need to really turn this around and begin to put a more positive face on the role of planning and its, and its impact and the, the role it might play with respect to families. So that started an effort with the American Planning Association to try to legitimize this kind of an approach. Well, the problem is nobody cares about families. Y'all do, but um, in general, as a society, uh, we're not all that friendly toward families, particularly families of young children. We, we consider children a luxury good. Nancy Fulbright, who was here yesterday, um, has a chapter in her book, The Invisible Heart, which calls, which said children as pets. And we sort of think of children as a luxury good. If you have them, they're your responsibility. And she argues, no, children are a public good. They're the future of our society, and we should be investing in them. But we don't invest in them. And so I began to think, could there be a link we could make with planning across generations, looking across generations, and the fact that we've got this elder tsunami of a lot of us in this room who are baby boomers who are <laughs> moving into that range. And, and the baby boomers are always, you know, change, change makers, right? Because we're such a big bump in the population pyramid that whatever time, uh, life, part of the life course we're moving through, the whole world notices that we're there. <laughs> so people are noticing that there's this big aging piece coming at us and that we really need to design our communities for people who don't drive cars anymore. Well, hello, if you think about that, you could design it for the pre-car generation and the post-car generation, and you could make a community that's better for everybody, not just better for old people. Hence the idea of a multi-generational link that could give you more inclusive policy and hopefully give you more political power to actually get some change done. So I'm going to run through each of these three arenas to give you a sense of, of what um, – of what I've been trying to do with my research agenda over the last 15 to 20 years on pushing out these paradigms. There's one more chair here in the front of the room, because I don't get to sit. <laughs> so the first one was this economic development approach. So traditional, when you think about early care and education, almost everybody wants to immediately go to the kids and improve quality of child care. But you, you can't think about that very long before you realize that children are cared for by parents, and parents need to work. And child care also plays a really important function in enabling parents to go to work. And when you make that link, you all of a sudden build common cause with employers who feel their workers' pain when parents can't show up to work or they're late or they have child care failures. And this now becomes an additional force to help raise attention to this issue of child care and bring increased resources to it. And then you make it a public problem. So it moves from the private problem of child inside family to a public problem as a social infrastructure for economic development. So in planning, we teach our students about designing transportation systems, roads, transit, to help people get to work. And now, thanks to the last 10 years of this work, we now talk about child care as a critical infrastructure that helps parents get to work. That's a radical shift. And it didn't come without a lot of critique because the, uh, the, uh, the uh, sort of human development focused crowd was upset that we were raising attention to the parents and regions issues. 
because it should all be about child development. Well, you know, if I lived in a world where children really counted, it would be all about child development. But I don't live in that world. I live in the U.S. And here, if I, if I make an economic development argument, I can build new allies that can help move attention. And the fact of the matter is, parents are stressed. How many of you had an easy time finding childcare that was quality and affordable? None of us in the room. Childcare is still a big, big problem that we as a society have not stepped up to address. So we used in this work, we used the trillium flower as a way to help people think about the fact that all three of these petals are important. And the trillium flower, if you pick off one of the petals, you kill the plant and it never grows back again. It's an endangered species. You pick it, it doesn't come back next year. If you pick off one of these petals, you've not given a full attention to the full ecological framework that we need to use when we're doing this kind of work. So what we did is, because I'm an extension person, is we created a Cornell methodology guide on how to do economic impact studies of the child care sector. And then we went, this was with a grant under the Bush administration with Health and Human Services, we got money to buy the IO models for every state, and we ran the models for every state, and we published this little um, uh, child care multipliers book. These are both on my website. And so this way, community teams from around the country didn't have to pay somebody to go and run these numbers for them. We had already run them. And then they could just build in their own narrative around the analysis that we had done on the multipliers, and they could add in much more that shows the texture and the nature of the, of the sector in each of their communities. Ninety state and local teams did child care impact studies. I helped with three of them. I mean, I helped do three of them and probably helped advise really closely on maybe another ten and then just watched all the exciting, innovative ways in which teams came together around the country to continue to do this work. Now, what did it do? It created a policy table, just like here in Tompkins County, where we had the banker and the social service commissioner and the child care resource and referral agency and the chamber of commerce and big human resource leaders of the major firms all sitting around the table talking about this problem. That was happening in communities all over the United States and even into Canada. And then we tracked some of what happened in terms of, of policy level change that these kinds of powerful local development, economic development actors could make, either in their local environment um, or from, from state aid. Now, let's think about this. Parents spend on average a quarter of a million dollars to raise a kid. And 77% of that is spent in your local economy. So everybody's about economic development and <laughs> recirculating money in the economy. And here you've got a whole ton of money getting spent by parents that's all being spent on local things, child care, housing, clothing, health care, transportation, food. You can see why so much of that would be spent in the local economy. And when you run the multiplier just on child care, for every dollar you spend on child care, it's another dollar of economic activity it generates in your local economy. And every job created in child care is another half job created in the broader economy. Those are better multipliers than the mall. <laughs> and you know the mall gets tax abatements and subsidies to come in because it's a job generator. Well, guess what? Child care is a job generator too, and it has a lot more positive social effects than the mall. <coughs> But the problem is most of our child care policy is focused on this formal part of the sector above the waterline of center-based care and licensed family-based care. Those are the ones that we see in our economic development data. The majority of child care is the iceberg below the waterline, unseen in economic development accounts. This top layer of informal paid care is a large part of that is seen by the child care licensing agencies at the state level. But it's invisible in any Bureau of Labor Statistics or uh, economic census data. And then the family, friend, and neighbor care and the parental care is utterly unseen in any economic data. And because it's unseen, it's ignored. You know, economists are really interesting folks because they make assumptions about how the world works. And then once they make their assumptions, they build very sophisticated and powerful models. And the things that they have ignored do not exist and therefore do not get any attention. And so the majority of care in our economy is ignored. 
We pretend it doesn't exist, and we give it almost no policy attention. And so all this work we had been doing on getting child care recognized for the little piece, the little tip of the iceberg that is in the formal traded economy, getting that recognized by economic developers, and that was a hard and radical push, let me tell you, because those models that we were using were based on an export-based notion of the economy that says local services don't count. There's a gender bias in this. Men's services count, women's services don't count. Commodified household production doesn't count. So anything that, that basically women are using doesn't count. And so when we started counting it using the same methodology that they used for other things, I said, you can't do that. Yeah, we know child care is in the model as a column in a row, but you're not supposed to measure it. It's just there to control because it doesn't count. And this goes all the way back to Simon Kuznets back in the 20s um, when he got the Nobel Prize for coming up with the measure of GDP. And he decided to leave out household production. And Margaret Reed, a home economist at the time, said, don't do that because you're leaving out the majority of the real economy. He says, it's not traded, therefore it doesn't count. And he won. And he even got the Nobel Prize for it. And we are burdened today with economic measures that ignore the biggest part of the real economy. Now, if you're in a developing country, this is really huge because we estimate this part of the whole economy to be about 70%. And to run economic models on the tip of the iceberg above the waterline isn't terribly helpful. Um, but the problem I was having with this is so we had gotten the formal part recognized and we were starting to involve it in policy, which was great, but we were still, ourselves, not addressing this informal part. So what kinds of policies might you use to take the stress off families, family, friends, and neighbors, to support informal care providers? What kinds of things might you use? And that led me, after all, I am a planning professor, to think about family-friendly planning. What might that look like beyond child care? What kinds of things could we do to give parents of young children their time back? You remember how stressed you are when you have little kids? You don't have time for anything. And so if there's ways that we could design our cities so that we are giving parents their time back, this would be huge because you know when parents get their time back, they spend it more likely on quality time with their kids. So this could be very important. So we convinced the American Planning Association to work with us to do a survey on planners' attitudes toward family-friendly planning. And we were dealing with a lot of attitudes that were pretty negative. So we started with focus groups at the American Planning Association Conference in Philadelphia in 2007. And we were like, can we turn the negatives of zone families out of your community to the positive of why you would want families in your community and then test those statements in a survey? And so the focus groups came up with things like, families are important to community growth, sustainability, and diversity. You know, and tell a life or scale, do you agree? And everybody agrees. <laughs> families are a valuable consumer population. Well, it turns out they are. People, planners are actually aware of that quarter of a million that everybody spends, right? But we thought, are the, is the average planner aware of that? Well, yeah. Communities that keep people for their whole, whole life cycle are more vibrant. Again, very high uh, agreement with these. Families are the most likely group to reinvest in their community through time, money, and other forms of civic engagement. The needs of families with young children are similar to the needs of elderly with regard to physical environment, parks, transportation, affordable housing. Here we only see two-thirds. But in that two-thirds is where I got the idea of moving to the next stage on multi-generational planning. I think, there's, I think if we were to test this again, we might get closer to 90%. Um, I'm actually on the AARP's Livability Indicators Task Force, and we're having a meeting this afternoon. And one of the reasons why they have me on that task force is because they bought into the notion that what's good for an aging population could also be good for little kids. And they're not opposed to the idea of bringing those two things together. And then the last one, which is the one you always hear people talk about, families do not generate sufficient tax revenue to cover the cost of services they demand. Just about half which I thought was good, that just about half don't think that's true. And so then we began to work on how true is that, and it turns out it's not that true, um, but it's a good way to, to bash families and to create planning policies that try to zone them out, and we're, this is what we're trying to change. So as we thought about the barriers to building family-friendly communities, 
we looked at the differences between active resistance, like blocking multifamily housing, or blocking mixed-use development, or blocking affordable housing, or lack of developer interest, or regulatory barriers, from the, the difference between that kind of active resistance and ignorance, lack of knowledge, lack of awareness. So lack of voice, insufficient political interest, insufficient community interest, the complexity. I don't know where to begin. And it turns out that ignorance is a big problem. And ignorance is actually easier to deal with. I mean, we're all educators, right? That's what we're here for. So we ran a regression model and discovered that what leads to action is family participation in the planning process and the nitty-gritty details of site planning and zoning, the rules. The rules that govern how you build your cities, the details of those rules, that leads to action. What leads to resistance is primarily ignorance. Interestingly, what also leads to resistance is your comprehensive planning process. This is where you come together as a community to set your goals. And in those goals discussions, you can get a lot of pushback. But once you get those goals set in the detail, the actual nitty-gritty detail of your planning code, so it works, that's what's going to lead you to action. And it's true, action does lead to resistance. NIMBYism is real, but you can overcome it. The positive attitudes help to overcome it, but the, the real thing we need to work on is, is getting rid of the problem of ignorance. And that gives us a great opening, actually, a great opening to work on this. And I expect to see the same kind of movement we saw with the child care work where I was told, Childcare has nothing to do with economic development and it's illegitimate for you to be using these tools for this purpose, to economic developers now in national surveys considering child care one of the issues they should be working on in their practice. And that radical shift has happened in 10 to 15 years. I expect to see the same kind of shift, in fact, I'm already seeing it with planners going from families aren't good for the community because they cost too much to families are really important to the community because they determine our future vibrancy and there's stuff we could do about it. What about the seniors? Well, we don't have the same kind of data on seniors, but I was able to work with the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, and they do a Maturing of America survey, and they did one in 2010 that looks at what kind of services for seniors are communities providing. And it has 41 services in areas of house, housing, health, care, workforce development, transportation, nutrition, recreation, civic engagement. And then it measures seven planning actions and two forms of elder participation. So see, we're getting at the same kinds of issues we were getting at in the family friendly survey, but I didn't design this one. I just was able to get my hands on to look at the data. And when we ran regressions on that, we asked the question, what leads to higher service levels? And we find that planning has a huge impact on generating both government services and services available in the market, but that may not be provided by government. And the way to think about this is that through the planning process and elder participation in planning and intergenerational programs, what we do is we raise visibility of an unmet market demand. Not only does this stimulate a government supply response, but it stimulates a market supply response. In New York City, the Age-Friendly New York City Initiative has a business, age-friendly businesses, where they're trying to make it clear to businesses that um, there's this huge demographic out of there called out there called older people, and they actually, even though they don't have a lot of money, a little bit of money among a lot of people is a lot of money. <laughs> That's what the bottom of the pyramid's called, right? And so you need to begin to think about how you can make your business more age-friendly. It includes things like including a chair to sit down in because when you go shopping you get really tired and your back starts to ache, right? And so you need a place to sit. So one thing that age-friendly businesses in New York City do is they have a place for a customer to sit. And I'm going to encourage Kim to come and have a seat because it makes me uncomfortable to see you standing. You must be getting tired. Um, so this is one of the things that they do. And so I, I see that planning is not only focusing on government, but it's also having an important impact on the market. And this is good because we're in the United States where the market economy is sort of the main thing we all care about. And so it's one place where you can really make some movement. So that brings me to the promise of multi-generational planning. So here's the idea. 
that we're going to try to create a common vision between the needs of little kids, the needs of seniors, and the needs of the stressed out caregivers in the middle. And this logo that we use is gendered for a reason, because guys, you haven't stepped up to the table enough yet. <laughs> and so the, the burden does primarily fall on women, both in the sandwich and in the senior, among the senior population. There is no retirement for women, because they are heavily caregivers of their men. Now, men are starting to increase their caregiving, but not enough. So there's a gender bias to this work that we absolutely must be conscious of, because if not, we'll reinforce gender bias by not, uh, not recognizing um, the, the heavier burden that women bear. Now, what can we do? We can think about our physical design of our cities in inclusive ways that include both little kids and seniors and all of us in the middle. And we can think about the possibility of shared services. And those are some of the things I want to talk about now for the rest of the talk. And if anybody wants to stop and ask a question or make a comment, I'm fine with that. Okay, so here's the idea. We have two global initiatives going on. We have UNICEF pushing child-friendly cities, and we have the World Health Organization pushing age-friendly cities. Silos, segregated, little kids versus old people. Actually, who does say age-friendly and they say all ages, but then when you read about it, it's always about old people, old people, old people. But you look at the list of what they're talking about, it's the same stuff on both lists. Hello. <laughs> Maybe we can bring this together because there's so many common elements. So last year I had a workshop class of my students in city and regional planning, and we were thinking about this, and we took whose curve on average functionality, and their curve starts here. And they say, okay, you, you're, you're, we're all here in this room, we're all average functionality. But as we get old, we lose some of our functionality, right? You lose your ability to drive, you lose your ability to climb stairs, whatever. What we did is we brought it back to the, to the early life. You get born, you learn to crawl, you learn to walk, you learn to ride a bike. Cool, man, you can go places. You learn to drive. Wow, there you're, you know, in this society, that's really big. So the idea is, is if we had better design of our communities, we could improve the functionality, particularly of children and seniors, people at two ends of the life course. And this has a lot to do with mobility, frankly, because we're in a society that, that um, privileges the car over the pedestrian. But you could actually increase the functionality of a wide spark, uh, spectrum of your population, and it'll even help the functionality of the caregivers in the middle, because you don't have to be a soccer mom as much, right? That's huge. The next thing is where you can't deal with it with, with the physical design, then you have to make up for it with service provision. So when we were looking at that Maturing of America survey, how many communities provide these services, if your community is, is blessed with a built environment that's got bad design, you're going to, in the short term, you're going to have to make up for it with enhanced services, paratransit services to help people get around, for example. So we took that model. Oh, that, so that's, that's the model behind our thinking. And you can say that's legitimate, that's not legitimate, but we think that's what gives us, gives us something to work on, both on design and on uh, service provision. Now then there's a political piece. Um, Julia Isaacs from the Urban Institute has estimated how much federal, state, and local spending, how much public spending is spent in our society per senior versus per child. Think a basketball and a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say to you, when I live in a society that doesn't really value children as a public good, we think of them more as somebody's pet, luxury good, you have them, they're your problem. That's why we have a tennis ball worth of investment. And what's worse is we expect local governments and state governments to bear the primary cost of raising kids, which is what leads to that <coughs> temptation to zone children out of your community. Let's look at it across the life course. This is work by Ryan Edwards, a National Bureau of Economics Research Report. And the red line is state and local expenditures by age, and the black line is federal expenditures by age. And what you see is the federal government doesn't give anything special for younger children. That burden is, is, is handled by state and local, and nobody cares about the under five. This is, the, this is one of the most fragile periods of life, and they get the least public investment of any age group in our society. This is very wrong. 
We desperately, desperately need to work on that. When you head out to older age, you see the federal investment going up because the federal expenditure is going up primarily because of Medicare and Social Security. But you also see local, state and local expenditures going up. What's this? This is paratransit services, Meals on Wheels, and at the very end, it's nursing homes. So in the end, having, having adults, older adults who end up in nursing homes is going to cost you way more than a whole bunch of kids in school. Right? And with the aging tsunami, all of us at baby boomers, this red line is going to push out. It's going to be bigger and bigger because there's going to be more of us in there. And all of the work at, on Capitol Hill to reform entitlements is going to push that line back, the black line back. So local governments are really going to feel it. And all the money is going to get eaten up by the older adult population unless we broaden the, widen the aperture on the camera and get all of us to care about little kids too. Baby boomers are the great selfish generation, so I, maybe we won't do it, but I have hopes because most of us are also embedded in family structures. Thank goodness for the human ecology framework, and um, maybe we'll care. There's a further reason why we – yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to make a comment. Um, as a gerontologist, um, oh God, at least 10 years ago, an economist wrote a book about intergenerational um, generational inequity and showed sort of the differences in expenditure. And what gerontologists finally sort of, um, one of the things they said was, why pit these two groups against each other, two of the more vulnerable? Um, and that, you know, obviously, like you say, Social Security, Medicare, there needs to be a lot of changes. But do you, do you agree with that about the sort of pitting the two groups? Well, that, that's why I don't want to do it. I show you the slide to show you we got a big problem. We've got a problem coming at us and a problem we've been living with for a long time and not caring enough about, okay? But we need to come together. But we've got another problem with coming together, and it's called racism. And that's this picture. So the majority of our young children are of color, and the majority of our seniors are white. And if this resource fight, which is not only across age, but it's across race, ethnic, and, and now class barriers, we're going to doom our society. We have got to come across this. And this is also another problem. So in the current survey I have out that's looking at planning across generations, we've got it out with all, city, county, all cities and counties in the United States, we're asking actual questions about diversity and bias. Um, in the way city managers see their communities and how they see how their members of their community see the needs across these generations. We must build a new social compact. Dow Myers has written a wonderful book called Immigrants and Boomers, and it has a picture of two hands shaking on the front. And basically he's saying, who's going to buy your house? If the young generation is too poor to buy your house, when you're ready to downsize, who are you going to sell it to? Who's going to take care of you? Who's going to be your nurse? Is she well-trained? Is he well-trained? So it's time that even if you were just selfish old baby boomers, that you would care about the educational investments of the younger generation because you want someone to buy your house and to be a good quality caregiver for you when you get old. What can we do? We can do lots of things. On housing. Family size house. These are these statistics I'm giving you here are from the Family Friendly Planning Survey, and it's asking how many of your communities have an adequate supply of family size housing. This just means two plus two bedrooms or more. You know, in transit oriented developments, they put in very few two bedroom apartments and a lot of one bedroom apartments because they don't want families to be there and they don't want additional people going into the public schools. So transit oriented development could be really good for families with young children but it's not built for families with young children. It's built for young professionals and empty nesters. Um, affordable housing, only 39% of respondents said they had any. Accessory dwelling units, only 25% said they allowed it in their communities. Now, accessory dwelling units are a really easy way to increase density. And they, they were sometimes called granny flats. Mm -hmm. And you see how you take your garage and you put a little house in the back. You've doubled density, and what you've also done is created the opportunity for informal resource transfers to occur between the, the little house and the cottage. Because who's going to be in this house 
may very well be a younger family with someone who can help with repairs. And who's going to be in this house may be an older woman who can help with some child care. I mean, you can build some intergenerational connections right into your community. Uh, we're starting to pay more attention to sidewalks and bike lanes, which every community says they have but we know they don't have them on most of their roads. <laughs> so on the current survey we have, we're asking them, what percentage of your roads have sidewalks? <laughs> um, Walk-to-school programs are becoming uh, more important. Child care. Only 20% of planners reported that their communities had an adequate supply of child care. That's probably too high. <laughs> Family home child care allowed by right in only a third of all communities. That means if I want to be, if I want to, to do family child care in my apartment, I'm not allowed to by zoning rules because zoning rules segregate male work from female home space. Truly, this stuff is, is, is embedded in a gender bias that goes way back. And you've got to change those stupid codes because... Family child care is really, really important, not just the licensed part, but all the informal child care. That's where the babies are. Infants aren't in centers. There's very few center slots for infants. The babies are in homes. Mixed use. Allowing mixed use now 90% too. That's a huge change from what it used to be. Requiring parks and playgrounds, we're just around 70%. But these are the kinds of things, so the nitty-gritty of site planning and zoning. Do you see it? The nitty-gritty, get those rules changed. We made those rules, we can change them. Joint use. This is one that I think could have a lot of potential. So you think of your schools as a silo. Separate world, do not enter here. Only 45% of planners collaborate with their schools even in the siting process. Can you imagine that? Almost anybody who sites any new building in a community has to work with their planners, but not the schools. <coughs> Co-locating services in schools, only 43%. I think there's huge potential here. You think of the, uh, here's the Denver, the old Stapleton Airport area, where when they built the new community, they thought about the school being a community service center and providing some of the recreational facilities for the community. In Charlotte, North Carolina, they have a joint capital task force and it involves eight, uh, heads of, eight, of like 25 agencies. And here's a case where you've got a light rail station You've got a three- or four-story uh, uh, garage, so it's a park-and-ride lot. The school's built next to a ravine, so they didn't have enough flat space for a playground. The top of the parking garage is the playground. So they're using federal transit dollars, local and regional transit dollars, school dollars to build a full-service complement. Makes sense. Um, Obviously, for technology, thank God for young people, right? Because they tell us how to use the computer. <laughs> and even in New York City, this is the one that I, that I find particularly interesting. So only about 15% of communities in the United States have public transit of any type. 100% of communities in the United States have a school bus. You think of all these seniors who can't get around, and you think of these school buses that go up and down every road, every morning, and every afternoon. <coughs> in New York City, where they do have a transit system, they're using their school buses to take senior citizens to the grocery store. Because you know how hard it is to lug heavy bags of groceries for more than a block? So between 10 and 2, they're using the school bus to take seniors to the store. Couldn't we do something like this in our community with our school buses? Think about it. And think about the school being the place where you deliver your social services, particularly for rural communities that are losing young, young population, rather than close the schools down, which is Governor Cuomo's hope, with the tax cap and 40% of the school districts going bankrupt in a few years and forced consolidation and closing those buildings. Instead, we should be reimagining the use of those buildings as community centers for recreation, for health and social service delivery, and they already have a transit system that goes through the entire community and brings people down to that center and takes them home. What are the barriers? Maintenance, operations, liability and security. Oh my God, can't mix people. The cost, scheduling and staffing. You know, the typical thing. This is not a public playground, stay out, lost. Three o'clock in the afternoon. So Tucson looked around, and you know how we say if a kid doesn't have a park within a half mile, they're not going to use it? Well, most poor kids, most minority kids don't have a park within a half mile, 
we got an obesity problem, right? You either create a whole bunch of park space, which is really expensive, or you get your schools to partner with you and open the gates. And that's what they did. The police helped provide supervision. They shared in the cost of mowing and maintenance and they have now achieved their goal of park space more accessible to all their residents. Impact fees. Developers need to pay taxes. They need to pay more than taxes. They need to pay for the services that you need to have in a community when you build new housing. I was in Australia. They had brought me out there to talk about new community development models for providing social services. And I was going to talk about how California has been charging impact fees for childcare for about 10 years. So if you're a developer building a whole bunch of new houses in a neighborhood, you have to build childcare or pay a fee so that childcare can be built because who's going to be able to afford a lot and a building in that new neighborhood to make a childcare center possible? You've got to think about that up front and design it into your neighborhood. I thought this was really cool and new. But I got to Australia a week early and I'm getting to meet with city managers and planners for my week before I give my speech. And on the very first day, they're talking about impact fees. And when they build a new community, it gets a park, it gets a bike, it gets a, it gets bike bike lanes, it gets a recreation center, a library, and childcare. They build all that in for their with their impact fees, and they've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> so I love it. <laughs> and um, and people now expect that when they buy a house in a neighborhood, it should come with the relevant community services. What we discovered, I joined up with a, with a colleague on, um, on looking at these impact fees, and, we, and he's a criminologist, and we linked it to, uh, to crime data, and we discovered that after you control for all the variables that would likely lead to higher crime, controlling for that, if your community uses impact fees, you have lower crime rates. Well, now why would that be? Because children who have something to do don't get into trouble. So the fact that you build a library or a recreation center after two generations of children have already grown up and left the community isn't going to help the kids who are there now. You're only young for a couple of years, and you've got to get it when they're young. So I'm thinking this might be a strategy for the future. Maybe we can build a common vision. Maybe we can think about more shared services instead of segregated silos. Maybe we can rethink our designs, which we're going to have to do with the aging population, but do it with a wider lens that also thinks about children. And maybe we can get somewhere. That's the goal. We've done a whole bunch of little short issue briefs, which are on my website, around health impacts, rural differences, gender issues, uh, joint use, and I welcome you all to look at them. And I welcome any critique and discussion that you all want to offer. Thank you. communities with step services and I had a I had my mother-in-law was in such a place and I was kind of jealous because um, you know there was a cafeteria where you could go down to eat there was a band to take you to the mall or the doctor's office there was a a, a rec room there was a shop room where you know all the guys had their saws and stuff and it just seemed I was like our kids were really little at the time and I was like man I'd like to live in a place like this with little kids this would be so cool but we built it on a segregated model well, it turns out, how many of you in this room want to live in an age-segregated community like that? And this is the problem. Developers have built them. Planners got a special thing in through the law to allow discrimination on the basis of age. It's called over 50 housing. It's legal. And um, a lot of those facilities are now having trouble recruiting people. Hey, I, I want to take care of my grandchildren. Maybe they're going to come live with me for a while. It's not, not allowed. You know, so... 
So I think there's going to be some retooling. Already in Westchester County, some of these are retooling, going back to the Planning and Zoning Board and saying we want to change our charter to allow younger families in. Uh, a lot of those actually, though, were built in green fields, don't have adequate sidewalks. They're very car-oriented. But I think we have the opportunity, particularly with the AG baby boomers, to rebuild communities that are mixed use, that are more walkable, that pay attention on having easily accessible services. We can actually change. We are the demand function. And if we speak loudly enough about our interests, developers will respond. And we've just got to keep, keep get our rules changed that had segregated public and private um, into more of a mix. But I think it's possible. And it's not like, yeah, you can look back in the past and you can see this stuff. So it, it's not like it's unimaginable to us, right? Which is the good news. If you can imagine it, then maybe you can create it. But good point. Yes? I have one comment and one question. So. Um, the house that I owned was over 100 years old. We had an in-law suite upstairs, which the stairs could be a problem, but it was built just for that, built that way. So that had been, I guess, at the turn of the century, the way all the houses on that block were built. So you had an in-law suite for the in-law suite to see the children, all the houses were built that way. So that's just a comment. I'm wondering, you know, what was going on then that the houses were built that way for that expansion. And then the second comment and question I have is, so vegan schools were pretty big about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago through the Department of Education and locally, where the schools were envisioned as this place where the community could come to get services, um, intergenerational planning and programming. So I'm wondering what conversations are going on, not just with the families, but with departments of education around that model. Because there was a lot of excitement around that model. It grew from one, um, actually this New York, where it worked really well, traveled around the country. Now you're not hearing as much about it, but that was really the concept, that the schools would be a place where all things could happen. So two, two, two questions. First, your in-law suite upstairs may not have been an in-law suite. It may have been maid's quarters. And when I was at this, we had a special focus group session at the small town and rural division of the APA. We were asking how are rural communities going to address these issues because they don't have development pressure. You know, there isn't a demand curve that's pushing new development to happen. And one guy said, you know, it may be not politically correct to say this, but maybe we need to think about a 21st century version of a zoning ordinance that allows maids quarters. But what these would be, would they be in-law suites or would they acknowledge that some families live quite distantly apart and the person who is there may not be an in-law, they, they may be someone you're not related to. <coughs> and we have a lot of zoning codes that don't allow more than three, uh, more than two unrelated adults to live in the same house. So we do need to go back to revisiting these zoning codes, but being careful about our definition of family. In fact, maybe we should get rid of definitions of family because they're all biased and don't reflect the reality of the family types we all live in. But this notion that you could have two households in the same housing unit or three households in the same housing unit, and this would not be bad. This could actually be good. It could even be good for property values. And the reason why a lot of it's zoned away is because it's assumed to be bad for property values because multifamily is bad for property values. It's not clear that's true anymore. A lot of us would like to live in those kinds of homes. And how are you going to retool all those mansions in the suburbs? You're going to have to turn them into houses that hold multiple households. So they're talking about golden girls apartments. I guess like the Golden Girls TV show from our youth. But the okay, the horrible name, but that's the word they're using. The other word they're using for it is greenhouses, like we're all plants and I don't get that one either. But the idea is you've got three or four single older women living together in a house. And I think of my mother and stepfather at their at the last ten years of their life, they were like two poles inclined against each other and they held each other up, right? But when one went down, the other one went down. And so if you think about the idea, and there's going to be a lot more of us women than men, that, you know, we could all, like, live together in a house and maybe, you know, hold each other up. But you've got to change zoning calls to allow that. With respect to the schools, we do have models, and Beacon schools are an example. What we need to do is change the perceptions of people like Governor Cuomo, who thinks the way to take us forward into the 21st century is to close down rural schools and force consolidation and greater travel. 
when we could be reimagining how these schools function as community centers, particularly in rural communities where the population is aging and there are no other services. To do this, you've got to get beyond what we call the Columbine effect or the Sandy Hook effect, where people think that every adult who comes in the school is there to hurt you and to realize that, no, these are the people that help you because it's a community that helps. There's some in, in McGraw, New York. They, um, they do um, community feeding programs in the school cafeteria. Think about a third lunch period for seniors. And then they could hang around and read to the kindergartners. Wouldn't they love that? Wouldn't that be so cool? And then they could ride the bus back home together, and you wouldn't have to pay for bus monitors. I mean, just imagine it. <laughs> uh, but there's all these rules against it because of security to protect frail elders and security rules to protect children, and you've got to get over those. But you can get over them with creative, open-minded thinkers and state policymakers who are willing to move a little. Yes. Yes. I, I was kind of doing a little utopian thought experiment with uh, with your beach ball and tennis ball and the uh, you know the expenditure curves across the line course mm -hmm. and I was you know just pondering how much of that high expenditure curve late in the you know that high expenditure late in the life course how much of that is you know essentially corrective for preventable health problems and other preventable problems that if there were more expenditure earlier in the life course, you know, wouldn't happen. So, you know, if you're looking at planning across the generations and supportive services across the generations, you bring up expenditure, you know, across the board earlier on, but there might not be that same bump at the end. That's possible. The other thing I'd like you to think about, though, is this functionality curve and the issue about design. Where was that? That was earlier. Yes. Yes. If you were, you know, there's a, there's a current notion that, that new design guidelines should require visitability. Where do these people come up? <laughs> the idea is that you should have a wide door big enough for a, for a uh, wheelchair to go through. You should have a bathroom on the first floor and a zero-step entry. If every new house had that, you could age in place. Now, that isn't going to put a cost into this part of the cost curve. That's going to put a cost into the developer's cost, which probably won't even be that much, because once there's more demand for 36-inch doors, there'll be 36 inches. It's not that hard, right? Once you get it into your habit, do you know why? I love this one. Do you know why the plug is down here? It's hammer height. It's convenient to the builder who's hammering in two screws once. And for the rest of our lives, we're bending over, right? We're worried about it with little kids because they can reach it. We're worried about it with older folks because they might fall. And falls are the primary thing that sends you to nursing home. So put the plugs up here. Duh. Okay, so you'll have to carry around a yardstick instead of your hammer. I think the construction guys can handle it. But you've got to change the rules. Yes? I'm kind of struck when I hear things like this. How much, how much of the rules and the regulations are, are, are come out of fear? And they just come out of fear of what might happen or what could happen or what did happen. And they just... have to actually go clear it out. When you get too much rural scar tissue, you get rural rigor mortis, and then you need to like break out. This was Max Weber talked about the iron cage of government bureaucracy, and that's rural rigor mortis. And so there are times when you have a paradigm change where you have to go in and re-engineer the system, and you need to blow up some of the rules. And so you need to remind people where the hammer came from, 
and things get stuck in time, inertia, you know, you did it and it just stays. And every once in a while you need to go, do a little house cleaning. And I'm not saying get rid of rules. I'm actually saying make some 36-inch doors, bathroom on the first floor. But make them that make sense for us. We make rules for us. We can remake rules for us, but we do need to have a sense of who us is. And if us is just the old, it won't. we won't make rules that are also good for the young. And that's why I want this broader vision of who the us is. And when you get that broader vision, I think it will be less motivated by fear, because once we're us, it's not so fearful as when it's them. And creating more spaces for us. And you'll remember that in one of our regression results, we had... More intergenerational programs led to more services. Now, who makes the rules for services for seniors? Not seniors. Those of us who are still out actively <laughs> making the rules, right? So if you have intergenerational programs, we might be more sensitive to the needs of other people because we interact with them and we see the needs. We see them and we see them struggle. And we go, I could change that. I could actually go back to my office I know how to change that rule. Wow. <laughs> right? So that's the kind of that's where I see this possibility to overcome fear and to, to but but we gotta have a place where we come together and that's where I really hope the schools will step up to the plate on this one. Because they're the place where we can come together across all the edges. I think we may have time for one more question. Then it's oh see, yeah. I just wondered if you could envision the time when the AARP mobilizes its membership to vote in favor of higher taxes for preschool education. Here. You know, um, they're not that far away. I was surprised. When I was at the first um, Affordability Task Force meeting last December, and I was speaking out about the different needs of rural because these livability indicators all favor the newly developed mixed-use neighborhoods, and so the rest of us who don't have enough money to move get to live in unfavorable communities and we can't do anything. And I'm like, no, no, we need to think about all communities. And I also kept raising the issue of children. Some huge percentage of grandparents take care of grandchildren. Children and child care are a big issue for the AARP, a very big issue. In fact, they've coined the term grand families to talk about this group. So they are not at all opposed to opening up to this. And in fact, I've, uh, I've gotten some support from them. When we were trying to think about how to name this work, whether to call it uh, you know, child and age-friendly family planning or family-friendly planning, and which words exclude and exclude who, and one of the AARP staffers was saying to me, Mildred, you've got to keep children in there because there is this problem of, of sort of crowd out that when you talk about aging, it tends to crowd out the interest of the other ends. And so something that an age-friendly, people immediately thinking it means old age-friendly. So we finally landed on the term planning across generations, so it's real clear we're talking across. But they've been very open to it, at least at the planning stage and on this this conference call that I'll be on later this afternoon where we're talking about the livability indicators. They're definitely open to thinking about how this is good for children, too. And I'm also on the American Planning Association now has an aging policy task force that's coming up with a new policy guide, and the word multi-generational occurs in there about ten times. So I have not found resistance to inserting children into this the way I found resistance to inserting child care in economic development. It's been a much easier <laughs> process. And I think it's because a lot of grandparents have grandchildren. They can relate. So I'm actually, I'm actually really hopeful. Um, the problem is, is that we're attacking benefits for seniors. And I didn't, I didn't anticipate that. I anticipated getting seniors to be more generous about sharing their political power with everyone else in society, particularly little kids. But right now there's this major assault on benefits to seniors at a time when the average person, age 45 to 55, has $12,000 in savings for retirement. And we're going to talk about cutting entitlement and what's that going to do to this line for local government. I mean, we really have an issue. So that will affect, I think, a little bit of the politics. But we do need to get an us back in here. And what kind of communities do we want to live in? Do we want to grow up in? Do we want to grow old in? And if we think about what that is, let's go make them.
Well, I want to say a tremendously big thank you to you for speaking about today.